Okay, so welcome everyone to another Robotics Australia Group webinar. I'm Sue Kay, the Chair of Robotics Australia Group, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Hugh Durrant-White, New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer, and Commissioner of the Natural Resources Commission, Commission to join us here today. Hugh's background includes being the Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK Ministry of Defence, a Professor and ARC Federation Fellow at the University of Sydney, the CEO of the National ICT Australia, NICTA, and Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Autonomous Systems and of the Australian Centre for Field Robotics. Hugh is a world leading authority on machine learning and robotics and applications in areas including cargo handling, mining and defence. He has published over 300 research papers, graduated over 70 PhD students and has won numerous awards and prizes for his work. He is particularly well known for his work with Patrick in delivering the automated container terminals in Brisbane and Port Botany, and for his work with Rio Tinto in pioneering and delivering the automated mine of the future. He's an honorary fellow of Engineers Australia, a fellow of the IEEE, of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Australian Academy of Science, and a fellow of the Royal Society. You've probably heard about the coming Chippergeddon, and in this webinar, we're going to look at how constraints on the supply of semiconductors will influence the robotics industry and Hugh's plans for a New South Wales Semiconductor Bureau. So welcome, Hugh, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation about the New South Wales Semiconductor Bureau, and then we'll move through some questions, and then there'll be some time for some questions and answers with the audience uh, and panel members at the end. So. Um, please, I'll hand over to you, Hugh, and I'll see if I can make sure we can actually see your face as we as we move through the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Sue. Look, I um, wasn't really quite sure, I have to be honest, what to talk about uh, in the intersection of semiconductors and robotics. Um, but what I thought I would do is I would um, tell you essentially what's going on in New South Wales in the semiconductor area, because it's been growing over the last two or three years. Uh, and it's been now is now quite a focus for um, some of our activities uh, and also to really talk about, I guess, a lot of the industries that underpin that that actually do use semiconductors and supply the robotics industry in general. So try and tie those sorts of uh, two pieces together. So um, just let me check I can get this to work. Yep, that works. So it's been an interesting couple of years, actually. Uh, back in 2019, we actually uh, were approached by um, uh, uh, a number of people, uh, particularly from the Sydney Nano Institute, about really trying to understand where semiconductors were in Australia and where we should be going in this area. And I have to say, at the time, I took quite a bit of convincing to, to cough up some funding uh, so that they could basically look at this. But I have to say that everything that they did surprised me in lots of different ways. And you've got to look back at 2019 as an area before the current um, issues around chips that we now have. And since then, a lot has happened. I'm sure you're all aware of it. There's been uh, the semiconductor industry has grown in prominence very, very rapidly. Uh, although, interestingly, in the last, I guess, three months, it's now on a downward trajectory again, particularly in memory chips, but also to a degree in processing. It's also been the subject of a lot of um, angst, I think, uh, particularly in the US around sovereign supply chains and uh, things like that. Uh, and also, I guess it's become more prominent in the sense of the importance of the industry to uh, not just robotics, but a whole range of different uh, industries. And it's interesting also to see how the industry itself has kind of evolved in lots of different ways. So I think first and foremost has been the kind of understanding that really now in the world, only two companies, um, uh, TSMC and uh, uh, Samsung, actually develop chips uh, at the kind of uh, level which is competitive to make things like cloud computing uh, and other things. So in the five nanometer scale, um, and in particular, nobody in the US does this, no one in Europe does it. And yet at the same time, the tools and facilities are built again in different places. So um, there is a single company in Holland that basically builds almost all machines that manufacture chips. 
Okay. Uh, there is probably one at most one and a half companies that do all the design tools for manufacturing chips at this level. So it is an incredibly polarized industry. Uh, we rely on very, very few companies to really do state-of-the-art semiconductors uh, across the globe. And of course, it, the importance of the industry has really changed beyond all recognition. And I think the other thing that impacts it is there is um, so many ways in which people make money out of the semiconductor sector. And they, it's almost like uh, the most expensive thing you can do is to make a semiconductor. And the way of losing the most money is to make a semiconductor. People make money actually by designing chips and selling them. Uh, fabulous, so what are called fabulous uh, foundries. Uh, and probably, arguably the best example of something like that is Apple. Apple design a lot of their own chips, um, but they fabricate nothing. Um, all of that's done by TSMC uh, or by Samsung or whatever. And the same is true in the communications area as well. Interestingly, a lot of the top-notch communications chips are actually bizarrely designed in Australia. Okay, But clearly, we do not fabricate many of those chips. They're fabricated at lots of other places uh, across the world. So it's a very, very interesting industry in lots of different dimensions. And it's also increasingly critical, not just as an industry in its own right, but in the fact that it drives a lot of other industries that hang off the back of it. Uh, everything from defense to medical devices, to communications, to robotics, you name it, basically hangs off the back of the semiconductor sector. So what do we do in this? We sort of set up this group uh, to uh, do what we call the Australian Semiconductor Sector Design to answer a few questions. Uh, and this, you have to remember in the context, started pre-COVID. So before really the semiconductor industry uh, issues, I think, became loud and proud as they are now. We really asked the question, so what's the state of play globally and in Australia? Uh, and in particular, what was out there in Australia? And what's our capacity in semiconductors? You know, are we just kidding ourselves about getting involved in this industry at all? And then added onto the back of that, what's a realistic development pathway? Uh, quite clearly, we're not going to get suddenly into you know, uh, five nanometer CMOS, it's not going to happen. Um, but what else could we actually do in this sector that would help us both in terms of supply chain and in terms of the industries that perhaps we want to build out into the future? So they wrote a report, it's on our webpage. Um, interestingly, all right from the very start, it had a real national and global impact. We were getting calls from companies, not just in Australia, but large international companies uh, in Taiwan, in the US and in Europe about basically opportunities in Australia. So it, it really, um, I guess, changed the way that we all felt about this and really compounded or, or you know, our wish to actually get something done. Uh, and also, truthfully, it did a lot of work helping to persuade both our state government and, in truth, uh, what's now going on at the federal level as well around what we should be doing in the semiconductor um, sector in general. So I've got sort of two overheads that kind of lay out, I think, the, uh, the important things. These are both from the report, incidentally. Uh, this shows you a kind of picture of uh, what the global semiconductor industry looks like in terms of what they do and what the dollars are associated with it. So the semiconductor sector's got, kind of got lots of different pieces to it, um, like a big, long supply chain. And like I said, I think one of the interesting things is that quite a few subsections of this are owned by one or only two companies. Uh, and I think that's a kind of key thing that everyone's suddenly realized uh, in these areas. So right at the early stage, there's the materials, there's the design tools, there's the equipment that you use for fabrication and all of these things. And there are surprisingly few people in this space. Um, I think that's been very, very interesting. And this covers, I should mention, not just silicon, but compound semiconductors like gallium nitride, silicon carbide, gallium arsenide, all of these types of things. Then there's a whole piece around design. And uh, we're familiar with well-known companies like Arm. Uh, Arm is a, you know, a, a critical company um, that people keep on trying to buy, um, uh, which designs an awful lot of the pieces of semiconductor that everyone uses. Um, so the basic CPUs, low power CPUs, uh, uh, low power access and registers and things like that are all designed by these companies and then integrated onto everybody else's chip. So you basically go to that company and you buy like a CPU design. And then you take that CPU design and then you add it to perhaps your own memory design or your own other bits that you might've got from somewhere else. And you basically design a chip, all right, using all those bits and pieces. And then you send it off to someone else to fabricate. 
And um, it's interesting because that area of stuff is, is a big business. It's a hundred billion dollar business, fabulous semiconductors. Great companies like uh, NVIDIA is a good example. NVIDIA make none of their own semiconductors and yet they're beginning to dominate high performance computing in general, right? So um, hang on, looks like you've managed to get it to work. Whoa. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so NVIDIA are a good example of companies that basically do that. Um, uh, a lot of other uh, places, and truthfully, quite a lot of companies in Australia are in this fabulous area, as I'll come to uh, in a minute. And then there's the fabrication piece. And I, I want to just point out to you something, so if it isn't obvious already, right, is that actually the fabrication bit has got less market value associated with it than either the design or the sales and marketing by a long way. All right. In the manufacturing sector, they call this the smile curve. All the values created at either end of it and not in the actual making piece. Uh, and I find this is pretty interesting. So, you know, fabrication, 42 billion. Um, and a lot of that is in, you know, pretty much, you know, fairly standard CPU, memory, that kind of thing. OK, it's a it's a standard process once you've got underway. And you also need to bear in mind 42 billion is the market. Um, you know, market value, global market value 2019, it still costs 10 to 20 billion to build state-of-the-art fab. All right, so these are enormous investments with low margins, okay? Other things, um, packaging also very, it's becoming a lot more important than that 31 billion would, would indicate because increasingly people are packaging not just the actual chips and things like that, but also the interconnect. So photonics, uh, other types of sensing technology, these sorts of things, integral is part of the packaging. And that's increasingly becoming important when you get to things like, you know, uh, photonics and quantum and other sorts of pieces that well, may well be important in the robotics area. And then 420 billion, the lion's share of this is actually the products, okay? It's taking a chip and making it do something useful as part of another product. That's really where the value add is. And I think that's a very important insight, right, into understanding what this whole thing sort of, sort of looks like. So that kind of gives you a feel. Uh, integrated device manufacturing, there are very few people who do everything. Uh, Intel is perhaps one, but it is no longer interestingly competitive uh, in all areas. And I think, again, that's important as well. So there's lots of insights about what's important, what everyone's doing, uh, what's state of the art, uh, what's not state of the art, and these sorts of things. And layered on top of that, we also did, um, sorry, an understanding of where Australian industry sits. So this is kind of an aligned picture and you can see same top line here. So you've got inputs, design, fabrication, packaging, sales and end markets. And if you look down here, there are companies that are involved in Australia in basically doing these sorts of things. So, you know, just to pick out people like, you know, um, L3 down here, which does design of a lot of circuits, AMD, uh, Ordinate, uh, and these sorts of people, uh, Morse Micro, who do basic ASICs and are now doing different different types of uh, uh, things. And along the top here, you can see how they basically align. So it's interesting. We've got a lot of companies that do design that have been very, very important um, in lots of different areas. A lot of foreign companies that have set up design shops uh, in Australia, particularly, again, I'll emphasize in the, um, uh, in the communications area uh, and in medical devices and things like that. We have one or two people who do fabrication, but we only fabricate typically in the so-called compound semiconductor area. And also most of this work is also not chips, not chips in the sense of processes or memory, but rather devices, okay? And I'll come back to that in a minute. There is no packaging at the moment. Um, and so one of the problems that we often have in this country is that we, even when we fabricate, we have to send them somewhere else to actually be packaged. And, and interconnected with PCBs and things like that. Very few people in Australia do this kind of stuff. Sales and marketing, lots of different people, um, both international and local, that integrate uh, chips, that sell chips, um, that integrate them into products in the defense sector, in the medical devices sector, and, and these sorts of things. So we've got a presence across here, but it is very, very small um, and very, very bespoke um, with some really interesting sort of pieces. So for example, if you look at some of the uh, more significant companies that are around, like, um, you know, uh, Morse Micro, um, uh, Broadcom, um, you know, uh, Blue Glass, and all these sorts of people, interestingly, they all originally came out of this sort of CSIRO physics Wi-Fi piece of work. So there's a lot of people who are alumni from that, who've taken their experiences and, uh, 
you know, if you like, used it to kind of build up that, that semiconductor um, scope. So we looked at all this and we said, okay, so what should we do? Uh, and that was kind of an important um, piece. So the first thing we did is we, we decided to have a workshop and hear from industry what it is we could do. And it blew, our, blew us away. We had 150 industries turn up, 150 industries. We really did not, we were not aware that there, there was this kind of interest and this kind of um, skill set across Australia. We, we really did not. It wasn't just a New South Wales thing. It, you know, we got people from all over the place. They were in semiconductor design. They did specialist devices. They did communications, compound semiconductors, packaging. They were doing applications in defense, medical devices, comms, that sort of thing. And everyone basically came because they had clearly individually, you know, had a desire to do something slightly more in this area to kind of integrate what we had in that space. And so we kind of undertook to do a couple of different things. Um, first and foremost, which is what um, uh, Sue mentioned at the beginning, we, we had a fund called the Emerging Industries uh, Infrastructure Fund. Um, and um, we had 6 million in it for that year. And we decided to spend that 6 million on establishing basically a design bureau, okay? Um, so S3B is largely a design bureau. It uh, tries to bring together people who need chips designing or who do design chips and are willing to help or participate or work with other people. So there's this whole piece you have to realize in design where designers don't design whole chips. What they really do is actually they integrate designs from other people into the single piece of silicon. And a lot of it is kind of, it's almost like open source. You can go out and, you know, either, you know, get for free a memory design or you can buy a CPU or you can do this and you basically stitch it together and you've got to know about layout and you've got to know about a few other things. Um, and then you basically can get up a design. And the other piece that you really want is this, is access to foundries. So once you've got a design, you need it manufactured. Uh, and at least at the moment, we have no capacity for manufacturing onshore or no significant capacity for that. So bringing it together and being able to engage with foundries in Taiwan or in Korea or in the US or in Europe, and there are foundries at that scale, is critically what the uh, uh, S3B is about. It's about being able to connect customers with potential foundries so they can get back chips either at a um, you know, prototype scale or indeed at a full production manufacturing scale. So you know, the Services Bureau is really there to service industry and potentially academia to basically get chips uh, that it needs uh, in a bespoke way. And we're right from the start, we've tried to make it international. We're talking to certainly our neighborhood, Taiwan, Singapore, and so on. And we've got very good relationships with them now in this area, but also to really try and involve the rest of Australia as well, not just a New South Wales activity. There's not, not enough, this, this is not a big enough area in Australia for us to act independently, truthfully. Uh, we have to kind of grow our capacity. And there are, like I said, niches of real expertise uh, all the way across the country. The other thing that we've uh, worked on that is now running is our training partnership. Cadence are the world's largest uh, semiconductor design bureau, uh, company. They will sell you for, you know, $200,000 a year seat, uh, you know, semiconductor design software. Uh, and indeed, the bureau itself is going to own licenses so that it can help doing design and that sort of thing. But we've also got Cadence to come on shore and lead the lead training of the trainers, if you like. Um, so through Bradfield, the new precinct out west that's doing manufacturing, uh, these are, what are they called, NEM, NetM, uh, new education training modules, uh, uh, they're now um, basically delivering um, design skills in, in semiconductor design and packaging and things like that, which is, which is really what we need to get underway here. And the other thing that I think took us all by surprise, we put up as a suggestion that the new advanced manufacturing research facility out in Bradfield, the second building should be in semiconductors and semiconductor packaging. And slightly to our, my surprise, at least, it got funded um, sort of straight off the bat. So 240 million of packaging facility. Um, clearly there's a little way to go. They're still only building building one at the moment. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a commitment to trying to fill in that niche. And packaging felt like the right area to get started. And I'll come back to that in a minute as to why I think that's probably the case. Uh, and certainly it's a push from industry in, in that area as well. Uh, but also it's about simply electronic fabrication and, and, and that sort of thing as well. So the AMRF is, is going to be key to that to provide these sorts of uh, facilities for, again, industry to, to have stuff done onshore. 
The other thing we've been very actively involved in is trying to attract international investment and, and to be honest, international skill sets. Um, because we, again, this is not an area uh, that where our skill sets are very deep. And I, I might make a mention here of the AMPH, uh, the Australian Nanofabrication Facilities. They're really the kind of um, center for expertise, uh, in, at least in academic circles, around semiconductor design and fabrication methods and these sorts of things. They're, they've been helping drive, as I'm sure people are aware, um, things like the quantum uh, uh, companies that are around and that sort of thing. So again, using skill sets in there, but also using them to really help us in, in, the, in, in, in the attracting investment as well. So we do have some interesting people already on shore. Broadcom, which is a large American company, does a lot of its uh, Wi-Fi chip design here. Uh, analog devices, uh, AMD. Uh, there's a number of companies that basically undertake design work here already, and we're really trying to build build on those and attract more people at that kind of uh, chip design kind of area. Equally, we are talking to fabrication people, as, um, but I will say, uh, I'll get to it in a minute. I don't think we're about to build a chip uh, plant anywhere near anywhere soon in Australia. But Intel are certainly showing a lot more interest in global ambitions. Uh, global Foundries, which is a kind of mid-tier uh, distributor that work very closely with a lot of sort of mid-tier um, chip designers uh, offshore. Wind semiconductors, who do a lot of the uh, compound semiconductors in Taiwan. So basically people like that. And also key users, um, as we become or try to become more sovereign in areas like defense, uh, there's an increasing wish to basically do a lot of that semiconductor design onshore. And there are good reasons for that because it's where all the capability is actually embedded. A missile is pretty useless without its semiconductors, frankly, whether it's the front end sensor or whether it's the communication devices or whether indeed it's the kind of you know, uh, computation pieces. So we talk quite a lot to the key users and certainly in New South Wales, we, we're really trying to position ourselves a lot more in the digital end of defense, uh, recognizing that they will um, uh, do shipbuilding in South Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of underway. We do a lot of work. This is clearly almost none of this is done inside government. We contract to a lot of people externally, uh, both academia and to companies to basically uh, get this stuff underway. So where are we going? Um, still a matter for discussion. I'm, I'm not, I'd be very interested actually to hear people online's views about some of these things, because I don't think we're for sure, you know, know exactly where we're going at the moment. So um, probably the key thing is design capacity in our view. So it's building the skills and the product development capabilities here, whether it's in defense, whether it's in, again, communications, whether it's in medical devices or robotics, if we can't design stuff, we will never really own it. Uh, and a lot of the value in products uh, is in that ability to design. And again, you look at things like Apple, Apple don't make anything, they design and sell them. And they're a, uh, rumor has it, quite a successful company. Um, the other thing to say is actually, you know, we don't have to go all out and design CMOS. There's a lot of interest in other things. Devices, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so this is, if you like, not, um, uh, this is not building, you know, big, uh, CPUs and memory and all the rest of it, but to actually build um, semiconductor devices uh, for other sorts of things. And I'll come back to that in a, a few seconds. And I think there's a big area in there that we could build and build relatively easily and build on the back of what we're already good at. The other thing is this fabulous semiconductor capacity. So again, there's a lot out there already globally, but there's no reason why we can't get involved in that and be part of that, particularly where we're actually developing products or where we want some on, onshore sovereign capability. And again, skills and product development, I think are key to that. We think, and this is sticking my neck out a bit, but an early win could actually be to um, build a fab, but build a fab that specializes only in devices, all right? So we're not talking, you know, uh, CMOS fabs or anything like that at this stage, but things where we can do compound semiconductors for sensors, for communications, for power systems, uh, radars, you know, electronic warfare systems, uh, these, this sort of stuff. It's not, you know, you can probably get a foundry, uh, you know, around that for, you could, you'd walk away with change from 50 million, let's put it that way. All right. So it's a kind of, it's, it's an aspiration we could go for. It ties in with a lot of what we have the capacity to do and perhaps where our expertise is. And there are definitely companies out there that would really benefit from having something like this. The other thing is in specialist areas. And again, we're, you know, uh, we're looking a lot at this. We've got a lot of skill sets in this country in photonics, 
which came out of previous CRCs and photonics industries, a lot of skill sets in quantum, a lot of skill sets in telco and interconnects. So again, specialist semiconductor fabrication that encompasses those and allows us to do that, that sort of thing I think is important. The other thing that we're interested in is hybrid packaging. So this is, a, this is again, a, a pretty much a niche area, but very few places uh, uh, really do this sort of thing. That is integrating in a single chip, things like optical, you know, mechanical, as well as processing, and actually being able to package them as an integrated system. Again, hits our main markets, uh, uh, hits the kind of thing that we would have the capacity to do. And like I said, places like Bradfield, this makes, this makes a lot of sense. So you can see where we're kind of heading, building the design skills potentially looking at doing a, a modest cost fab that would support the sensing comms and power industries uh, in general. My personal view is silicon, doing anything in silicon is a long way off. Um, if you look at um, uh, what you call global foundries, they have 35 nanometer technology. And in fact, you can go out and buy secondhand a 34 nanometer foundry, um, you know, and you could in principle buy it and set it up here and that would allow you to manufacture embedded devices. But the reality is it's a low margin game, okay? Unless you're genuinely gonna use it for prototyping. Um, and so it's possible, uh, certainly, and you would, again, walk away with change maybe from a billion dollars in this case, all right? Um, but uh, I think it's, it's arguably, we're just not ready for it uh, in any kind of sensible way. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the demand, uh, whatever. State-of-the-art CMOS, we are, I just don't think that's ever going to happen in this country. Uh, you know, uh, building a facility that will do less than 14 nanometers is a 10 to $20 billion exercise, uh, which means that you've got to be able to, at scale, manufacture, you know, chips for everybody, okay? Uh, and um, we're just not, it doesn't really seem the possibility of doing that. I think for us, Silicon is making sure we have a distributed supplier base. So we're not just buying from one person. The problem everyone's having at the moment is there is only one person in the world that supplies them, right? Uh, until Intel manages to catch up and perhaps manufacture its own uh, as well. And of course, everyone's talking about the same area. So I think for us, Silicon's a long way off. We can diversify our supply chains, but I think we should stick to some of the things that, that perhaps we can actually get some sovereign advantage out of. So I just mentioned a few examples here uh, in the that impact, I think, the robotics area. These are all Australian companies, incidentally, so or Australian derived companies at least. And I think it's interesting to know what's already going on. Advanced navigation are building state-of-the-art inertial navigation systems, uh, and even now looking at areas like quantum uh, navigation. So I think, you know, these sorts of things, they are desperate for sort of local hardware support. You can imagine using this sort of thing. Barrage as, as well, I'm sure some of you know, that build lasers, uh, um, great technology. And again, you know, interesting fabrication. Navtech, which is one of my own startups, building millimeter wave radars. Uh, again, in the uh, MMIC uh, compound semiconductor area, this is what drives these kinds of technologies for not just for robotics, but for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for um, uh, defense and a lot of other uh, applications. Morse Micro, as I've mentioned, um, standout company, really doing great things. And they're doing really low cost, long range Wi-Fi. Uh, so using different types of communication protocols and different types of frequencies and really trying to minimize the cost. And, you know, as we roll out more and more robotics, more and more IoT, this is the kind of technology that's really going to drive it in there. They're basically a fabulous semiconductor design company specializing in that. Quantum communication, this is an area that bizarrely we've got a lot of expertise, a lot of interesting companies. And again, increasingly, if we worry about security and integrity and a lot of other things, then these are the sorts of companies that are going to be important, not just to robotics, but to a whole range of things. Now, I might mention Quasar Sat, which is a company we funded out of the government here as well. And it basically, you know, uh, you look at that antenna, you can communicate with 140 satellites simultaneously. Um, you know, so with these low Earth orbit communication networks and that sort of thing, this is, again, critical technology and the front ends are, again, compound semiconductors and things like that. So these sorts of companies, these sorts of technologies that are important for robotics are the kinds of things that we would like to have a semiconductors industry that genuinely supports sensing communications. Now, you'll notice here what I've not talked about, because I don't think we will be in that game, is high powered computer chips for doing machine learning. 
It's just not going to happen in this country, uh, at least in my lifetime. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, it, it's not an area that we, we're, we're, in, we're thinking of getting. Of course, uh, we may have smart people who set up the equivalent of ARM who actually end up designing CPUs and things like that. And that may, that may come to pass. And of course, the applications we all know and love. I think, you know, when you look at what's been successful out there in robotics in Australia, you know, larger outdoor vehicles, you know, defense, agriculture, mining, these sorts of things. If you go back and look, they all rely on those sensors and those communication systems and everything that I've just been showing you. And I think that's the impact, if you like, of what we're proposing in semiconductors and where we're heading in this area and potentially what we could be using it for uh, in, in the robotics domain. So I might stop there. I think that's probably pretty close to half an hour. Yep. I can't hear you. Yes, thanks very much, Hugh. Yeah. So uh, we, I just had some, um, you know, preset questions to to go through with you. You've um, you've covered uh, on the some of the important elements of semiconductors for Australian robotics companies. So I might just uh, pivot a little bit on the first question in terms of what do you think Australian robotics companies need to think about in terms of um, you know uh, increasing their resilience. Um, to be able to continue to build robots here? Um, you know, how actively should robotics companies be, be looking at where their, um, you know, these technologies are coming from? And, uh, you know, you've given some great examples of Australian um, device manufacturers here. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure there's an issue so much with resilience, if you don't mind me saying. I think most, yeah. I mean, we're pretty used to ordering stuff on online and, getting whatever sensor or things, although we've always had a, a longer supply chain than, than most places. I think more, I don't know whether people have noticed this, but you know, has been the new CHIPS Act in the US. That's a worry um, because uh, a lot of the stuff we build robots out of now, you know, radars, chips, et cetera, uh, we can no longer export anymore. Yeah. Um, and it's not just because they're made with US products, it's because what's in them may not have been made in the US, but it's made if you like, what they're made from are tools that are made in the US, including designs like CPU yeah. designs and chip and, and memory designs and that sort of thing. It is, a, it is a significant challenge for a lot of industries, and it may well be in robotics as well. So I can no longer design and build an autonomous truck here and send it to you know where. Yeah. So that's more the issue in my view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, given well, where do you think Australian companies should be looking to source their chips from? Well, if it's conventional CMOS silicon, right, you know, yeah. that sort of thing, uh, then the obvious places that already make them, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of company, you know, the AM, I mean, AMD are doing good chips, Intel are doing good chips, the ARM processors, NVIDIA, you know, we have a lot of people who work very closely with NVIDIA these days for video processing. Um, uh, and also machine learning and that sort of stuff, you know, and they're they're literally off the shelf at the moment. And and let's be clear, the industry's peaked. You know, the current issues around the semiconductor sector probably peaked about three months ago, yep. uh, and now the bottom's dropping out of the the uh, value of, you know, particularly memory, but also CPUs. So I don't think there's a shortage anymore. Um, what I will say is, if you're looking at robotics companies that are doing things like building comms or building sensors. That's different because then they actually need to acquire their semiconductors uh, and they need to design their own semiconductors and they need to acquire those from foundries overseas. And this is where things like the, the Bureau come, in, come into play because if we can go to them as an industry, we will get much more airtime than if a company with 10 people try and go to them all by themselves. Yeah. And you've already mentioned that this is not an exclusively New South Wales service. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, um, it's a group of universities, but, but I mean, let's be clear. I mean, you know, uh, even from this distance, there's, there's some great design work that's happened down in Melbourne, you know, um, Stan Scafidis and people like that, um, you know, in um, radar on a chip and these sorts of things. There is one or two pieces going on in Adelaide. Um, you know, and so there are, there are places around the country and we all need this um, because if we're to, we're to genuinely 
get our designs fabricated, we need to work together to make that happen, both in terms of skills to get that design going, but also in terms of access to fabrication and production. Yep. Okay. Um, then uh, you've, you've already mentioned some of the challenges that we would need to overcome in the development of a local semiconductor industry. And you've mentioned yep. what you feel is you know, probably the lowest hanging fruit, where if we get an investment of about $50 million, we could be looking at uh, you know, doing our own specialized semiconductors mm -hmm. in the form of devices. Um, so what do we need to do to, to make that happen? You talk to me because I got the money. <laughs> look, uh, I will say, you know, um, look, uh, last couple of years, we, you know, um, look, uh, we, we've uh, pulled ourselves up a little bit relative to some of the other uh, governments. Um, you know, I think there's a tendency in government to only invest in things they know will work. Whereas I think um, there's a bigger risk appetite now in state government than there used to be. You know, our budgets moved up from... 30 million a year this year, this year in the budget, we've got 830 million. So, you know, there's a significant uptick. You know, we are investing in pilot facilities in other domains like RNA. So investing in a pilot manufacturing facility for uh, semiconductors is certainly not off the cards. Let's put yeah. it that way. Okay. Yeah. And I don't think it's us anymore either, because although we've been pushing this, I think now the Commonwealth are, coming, are thinking about, are thinking along similar lines. You know, and we very clearly involved Kathy Foley when we were originally setting up S3B, you know, yeah. because I think there's a, a broader interest than just what we're doing. Okay. Uh, so if, uh, if the pilot facility comes off, uh, you know, what would be next on your wish list? Well, I think a lot further down the line, we might think of a chip, something in chips, although I will say, you know, I think we should test our skill sets in the compound semiconductor area first. There are a lot of skill sets on shore already. It is a niche area that has genuine application. It's also quite hard to access. So although you can go and buy silicon most places, you cannot go and buy gallium nitride. Um, yeah. And yet gallium nitride is critical for, um, you know, radar and communications and all of that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, if we genuinely at that point have a big enough market and we've grown enough companies, then we could think about a, um, a low-end um, uh, contract uh, um, silicon fab. But yeah. my view is that's at least a decade off. Yeah. But it would not help robotics. I think I need to point that out, right? I mean, it wouldn't help much, let's put it that way, because this is a state-of-the-art fab even the US doesn't have one at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. So I think uh, we might move over to we have uh, something in the QA. I think you've gone part way towards answering the question. Uh, when you mentioned how Kathy Foley was involved in some of the yeah. consultations around SC3, uh, S3B, uh, the question is how does the semiconductor? plan line up with Australia's planning around quantum capability? Um, it lines up a lot because, uh, you know, um, as I'm sure people in this area know, there's a lot of interest in trying to use uh, effectively silicon manufacturing techniques to also manufacture uh, quantum computers. There are a few constraints on that. You know, it needs to be isotopically pure silicon, for example, and you've got to put little phosphorus dots on them and lots of other bits and pieces. But nevertheless, it does line up. And also, when you look at things that we're talking about here in terms of devices, there is an interest in producing devices like inertial measurement, gravity measurement, you know, and, uh, uh, and various things like that that are exactly in the quantum domain and exactly need this kind of fabrication facility. And certainly when we talk to government here, um, uh, we, uh, we talk about semiconductors and quantum in the same breath, as in it's an integral kind of strategy. Yeah. And I, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect uh, the federal government will be thinking along similar lines. They are doing a quantum strategy now. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, and they know about the semiconductors piece and the two I'm sure will come together. So they should be properly mutually supportive in my view. Yeah, okay. 
Uh, well, I'll leave it open for any more questions from the audience. Um, I, just going back to one thing that you mentioned earlier um, about how um, you know robotics companies uh, you know could fall foul of the US Chipset Act, um, and you know you did mention that in a lot of cases people are relying on off-the-shelf um, components anyway. Yep. So, you know, what do you think are going to be the challenges in unpicking <laughs> the the source of supply to be able to know whether, uh, you know, people are, are going to fall afoul of the, the new Chipset Act? Well, everyone's worried about that, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, and I have to be honest, we're right at the periphery of it. But I think of people like... Um, you know, uh, people who provide, like NVIDIA, for example, who provide boards for GPUs or whatever it might be, uh, <laughs> there's no way they're going to be able to export those without tracking it anymore. Oh. Um, or, um, you know, even little things like, you know, uh, you know, a, a medical device uh, that might have a piece of, you know, register or register or um, that sort of thing in, in a device. Uh, if that design came from, um, you know, um, you know, a fabulous designer like I've been talking about, that's effect effectively designed and built in, designed in America. So you'll be up for it then too. And also, don't forget, you could sell your medical device to, um, I don't know, Singapore or Malaysia, but you've got to track it to make sure it isn't being sold somewhere else afterwards, mm -hmm. right? So this is quite a draconian piece. I, I mean, I know why they're doing it, right? I mean, everyone knows why they're doing it, but it could be tricky. Uh, that's all. So robotics, you know, less so. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if you look at the history of robotics, progress has genuinely been delivered um, because people have come up with new sensor technology. All right. Uh, for those of us who lived in the days before uh, lasers, uh, you know, the coming of the time of flight laser changed robotics dramatically. OK. Um, and that wasn't even designed for, for um, robots. It was designed for something completely different. So it's the sensor technology rather than the processing technology, I think, that, that has driven change. Yeah. Um, but even then, increasingly, not just sensing technology, but Wi-Fi chips, you know, various other things like that, they, are, they all are subject to these sorts of things. And, you know, um, people like Morse Micro are designing down at the, you know, sub-14 nanometer um, scale. Uh, and so, uh, um, you know, that sort of stuff is basically owned um, yeah. you know, by someone else. So <laughs> that's the way the industry is. Yeah. But it, wouldn't, it doesn't stop things here. Um, you know, it's not preventing us doing stuff here. Uh, yeah. No, that's true. Although uh, I think that increasingly, you know, to be able to scale, you know, most Australian robotics companies really need to be looking at how they can have, uh, you know, be developing their export markets. So it's, it's going to be. Excellent. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, yeah, but what it means is, you know, there are going to be some markets which are now um, not going to be accessible. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, there's, and let's be clear, everyone's going to have this problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because I think this is part of the issue is it, the, uh, you know, at its base, the semiconductor sector is incredibly narrow. You know, there's one or two foundries. There's one person who makes the equipment that manufactures it. There's one design piece, you know, Cadence is an American company that does all the design software. You're not allowed to use um, tools, don't forget, American-made tools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you're you're pretty constrained. Yeah, uh, yeah. That, but look, still plenty of opportunities. <laughs> yeah, but it does sound like they, you know, in terms of the skills and capability development that you've been describing, uh, you know, may, maybe a, a support group in the future <laughs> to help people to navigate their way through this, uh, you know, new system could be quite helpful. Yeah. But look, I think in the robotics area at the moment, you know, I mean, uh, they're, you know, one of the biggest markets is our own domestic market, at least in the areas we've been good at. Uh, yeah. I think the challenge is how we, you know, build products that we indeed can properly export, you know, to those sorts of things. Um, again, I will say, I think the constraints are in the, arguably in the sensing technology and not in the processing technology. All right, well, I'm just seeing whether there are any more questions online. Don't be shy, everybody. I think there's a few questions actually not on the question link, on the chat link.
Oh, well, there is a request for your slides. If we, if you wouldn't mind sharing those around, I can forward them on to the audience, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, there's a suggestion around uh, C2MI, um, you know, as a potential partner in the US. Yep. Yes, I know them. Yep. We, we've uh, had a look at them for as a model, actually. And a comment that the, the CHIPS Act is also very difficult for US startups in robotics. I'd, I'd agree. <laughs> it, look, uh, it, it applies to everyone. It's not just us. Yeah. Um, Yes, and that, you know, it means that you need to build uh, uh, using US safe components. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. defining those is going to be... Uh, Look, I will say also, you know, there's an opportunity in this sector to build partnerships with other countries like Japan, who's, who's actually surprisingly strong in this area. I mean, not to, I, why am I I'm not saying, don't mean surprisingly, but they are strong and always have been in this area and actually look to Australia to be a partner in a lot of these things. So we don't always have to turn to the US and Europe. And I have to say, Singapore has also been good in this area. You know, 10% yep. of the semiconductor manufacturing in the world happens in Singapore, in fact. Yep. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, some good companies. And again, Taiwan is, uh, is very, very open. Um, yeah. So there are lots of opportunities in our neighborhood, I think, to collaborate in this area um, that, that really we need to, we really need to uh, uh, explore more properly than we have done. Yeah, and that could be a good topic for a, a future webinar. Yeah. Um, oh, there are a couple more questions. Uh, sounds like specialization in niche areas makes sense for Australia. Um, uh, someone would like your thoughts on that. Yeah, look, if you wanna get off the ground, we have to specialize. We can't just do everything on day one, right? And I mean, we do, for lots of different reasons, we do have some very, some strong groups in niche areas. I'm, again, I'll pick out the communications one. When you go around and you talk to these companies, you realize they all have one source. They all came out of Syro physics um, back in the 80s, all right? Um, you know, through Radiata and the design of the Wi-Fi system and so on. And then they've all basically gone off and done other things, but they all have this solid base in, in, uh, in chip design in general and in products. Uh, and you realize, and, and that makes sense now as a niche, right? If you see what I mean. And equally for unknown reasons, I'm not quite sure what the bottom is, we actually have some really good skill sets in compound semiconductors. So, uh, you know, uh, again, if you read the report, uh, you'll see where they are, but we've got a lot of groups in those areas. And so we can pick that as a thing. And that allows us to get off ground zero. It allows us to get into the skills development, design, interest students in the area, get universities involved, uh, start, um, you know, initially, you know, do, doing small scale manufacturing of, uh, um, you know, of some of these components at the device level certainly is easiest to do, build on the fact that we're good at quantum and other areas uh, and, and use that and photonics. So building out in that kind of way, I think is logical uh, in terms of what we do. What I think is not a good idea is to suddenly say we should be building a fab for our chips, which we're just not, we're just a long way from at this point. Yeah. And another question, how can we influence private uh, infra capital providers to back and or partner in building sovereign capability locally? Well, I think we do. So I'll just pick out a couple of the companies there, like Barraja, uh, Quasar, um, Quantum Brilliance. They're backed by Australian VCs. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, actually, we're getting better. In, I mean, we always were, we always are good in digital in general, right? I mean, it's where we... It's where we have skills in financing and understanding the global market and that sort of thing. But increasingly we have um, companies who are prepared to back that kind of um, what I call device startup, okay? I think we still don't have VCs that are gonna stick their neck out and fund a robotics company in the same way. Um, and I think to some degree that's our own fault because we don't really ourselves understand what a market is. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so on, but, but we have VCs that have those skill sets um, and they are investing in companies like the ones I talked about. Uh, and I think we need to help them invest by, as a government at least by underwriting the risk it would take to actually establish, for example, a prototype manufacturing facility. Yeah. And then hopefully more people will come to the party. Yeah, good, well. Okay. 
more power to you, Hugh. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing that all happening. Yeah. Okay, Sue. <laughs> so uh, I th we haven't got any more questions online. So <laughs> I um, thank you very much for joining us, Hugh. Um, uh, so I'm just checking the chat to see if there are any more. Um, no, just some thanks coming in from the audience. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is being recorded. So we will put this up on the Robotics Australia Group uh, YouTube channel in the near future. Uh, one thing um, that we're very excited about at the moment, and, and Hugh, I'm sure you will have some input into this, is that the federal government has announced that they are putting together a national robotics strategy, hopefully by early next year. And I think that's gonna be a good opportunity for us to really chart out and as you say, uh, you know, what is the market for Australian robotics companies and, and what we can do, and what are the ingredients that we need to make sure that, uh, you know, just as in the semiconductor industry, we're playing on our strengths and we're actually figuring out the best way to support the talent and the technologies that we're producing here in Australia. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Be good. Okay. Thank you for right. inviting me. Yes. Thank All you, right. everyone. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Bye.